Um, we're going to be talking about are humans related to chimps? And I'm sure many of you, or at least I hope many of you, are familiar with the biblical account of creation, specifically the creation of Adam and Eve made in God's image on the sixth day of creation about 6,000 years ago. And so the purpose of my presentation today is to show you how the science of genetics supports and is consistent with the biblical account of Adam and Eve, that we do not have a shared ancestry with the apes or any other living thing for that matter, and therefore that we all descend uh, from Adam and Eve, just as the Bible states. I want to show you that um, Christians have a reasoned faith. We do not have a blind one. So um, there are certain things that we read in scripture. Uh, science confirms and supports those things. And again, which helps, gives more support um, to the truthfulness of God's word. And there, the reason that I feel so burdened um, to share this information is obviously um, there are people who are not Christians that don't believe Adam and Eve um, ever existed. And that our um, completely human ancestry is true um, because I don't believe the Bible is true. So I understand why they don't believe it um, because they don't believe the Bible is true and um, they need to know that truth. But what makes me really sad is that it's a, it is a growing debate even among um, evangelical Christians whether or not Adam and Eve are real people. And um, the thinking goes that we did have a shared ancestry with the apes even among Christians. Um, this is just a few of the headlines that I've grabbed on this issue over the last several years. The rise and fall of Adam and Eve, exploring the myth of the original sinners. Does the story of Adam and Eve work scientifically? How do Adam and Eve fit with evolution? And if evolution were true, what would happen to Adam and Eve? Um, and this is from both um, secular sources as well as Christian sources. Um, even Christianity Today had it as the cover of an issue a few years ago. It said the search for the historical Adam, the state of the debate. And it is a debate. And like I said, this is just a few of the headlines. There are a lot of them out there on this. And what we are seeing is sadly is that many Christian theologians and scientists that are Christians are saying, well, um, the evidence says otherwise. Science says otherwise, that we didn't just come from two people. And so we have to believe that, that we did have a shared ancestor with the ape. Now, I want to share with you um, some quotes from those individuals. I, I don't want you to just take my word for it. And um, so the, the individuals I'm going to share the quotes from, they are professing Christians, okay? But they do not believe that Adam and Eve are real people. And so the first quote comes from a book um, that was co-authored by Carl Guyberson, who is a scientist and author of several books on science and faith, and Francis Collins, who's the head of the National Institutes of Health. And they write this. Literalist readings of Genesis imply that God specially created Adam and Eve and that all humans are descended from these original parents. Okay, so they say, that's how the Bible reads, right? This is what it seems to say. They say such readings, unfortunately, do not fit the evidence for several reasons. So they say, well, this is what the Bible says, but we can't believe it because of what the evidence said. Now, the next quote comes from um, a book that was called, it's called Adam and the Genome, and it was um, authored by Dennis Venema. He's a biology professor up in Canada, and Scott McKnight, who's a Bible professor in Illinois, and they stated this, we can be confident that finding evidence that we were created independently of other animals or that we descend from only two people just isn't going to happen. Some ideas in science are so well supported that it is highly unlikely new evidence will substantially modify them and these are among them. So what they're saying is that, you know, we, there is clear evidence that we descended from a common ancestor with the apes. They say there's clear evidence for that. It's not just two people and it's so well supported. We're not going to find any evidence to the contrary. Like we have so much evidence to support this that we can't believe otherwise. And then they go on to say, the sun is at the center of our solar system. Humans evolved and we evolved as a population. Now, see, I want you to notice what they did here. So they compare our common sense common ancestry with animals, okay, meaning no Adam and Eve, um, which has happened in the unobservable past as equivalent to the observable fact that the sun is at the center of our solar system, which we can know from observation. So they're equating something unobservable with something that is clearly observable. And so they're saying evolution is a fact. Um, humans did evolve from a shared ancestor with the apes. That's very clear if you read their book. Um, to them, it is not an idea. It is not a theory. It is a fact, and they want Christians to embrace it, right? So that, 
that is why I give this talk. <laughs> that is why I give this presentation, because I want people to know that when it comes to the scientific evidence, um, we always have uh, two choices when it comes to looking at the information, scientific things that have happened in the past. Do we believe God, who was an eyewitness to creation and inspired man to write that down, or do we believe man who wasn't there during the supposed millions and billions of years of Earth history? Because although they will keep saying the issue is the evidence, um, the issue is not the evidence. It's really our glasses, so to speak, when we look at that evidence, our worldview or our starting point when we look at that evidence. Uh, do we start with the infallible word from the infallible God, or do we start with fallible man's ideas about the past? Okay, the, those are the two choices that we have. Now, since my field of expertise is genetics, um, we are going to look at the science of genetics, and I'm going to show you that it is consistent with a literal Adam and Eve, that all humans descended from humans, um, and not a shared ancestor with the apes. I'm going to show you from a scientific perspective um, that Adam and Eve and our completely human ancestry cannot be denied, that we do have a reasoned faith. But after I do that for a little bit, and I'm going to explain this, I hope, um, really, really well and in a level that you can understand because I want you to be able to understand and be able to utilize this information. But then we're going to talk about why that matters. Like, why is it so important to Christianity that Adam and Eve be real people? So we're going to look at three questions. And the first two are scientific, and that is how similar is human and chimp DNA sequence and um, is human chromosome 2 the result of a fusion that supports shared ancestry with the chimp? So those are the two pieces of evidence that I see used most commonly uh, to support our ancestry with the apes. So that's why I want to address those. And then we'll talk about a more of a theological question. Why do a historical um, Adam and Eve matter? Why is that important to Christianity? So let's start with the science here. How similar is human and chimp DNA sequence? And one Christian theologian actually summarized the common thinking on this topic as well, and he would agree with it, sadly, but he said the Human Genome Project, completed in 2003, has shown beyond any reasonable scientific doubt that humans and primates share a common ancestry. So we sequenced the DNA of humans, we sequenced the DNA of chimps, we've compared them, he said there's no doubt, they're so similar, we definitely have a common ancestry. Now, my first response to anything like that is, well, what does the Bible say? Okay, because that's my starting point as a Christian. That's my worldview. Even as a scientist, right? All scientists, regardless of who they are, have a starting point. They have a worldview. And so I'm going to start there and say, well, what does the Bible say? And it says that God created animals according to their kind, and then God created man, right? So man is a separate creation from the animals, not a shared ancestry with the apes. And man was unique because man was made in the image of God. Nothing else was made in the image of God, only man. And Adam and Eve were told to have dominion over the animals, right? So clearly they're separate and different from the animals. So because the Bible is true, that's my starting point. Then when I look at the scientific evidence, I would expect it to support it and confirm it. And we'll see that it does. Now, many times you've probably read or heard that human and chimp DNA is 98 to 99% the same. Okay, I see it everywhere. We can go to the Cincinnati Zoo here, which is a great zoo, by the way, um, and they'll have a sign that reads that near the ape exhibit, right? They'll say, oh yeah, their DNA is very, very similar. But is that really true? Um, and I could show you lots of quotes on that, but I'm just going to share one. And this is a, a 2012 paper that was written by evolutionists, okay? And what did they say? They said, it is now clear that the genetic differences between humans and chimps are far more extensive than previously thought. Their genomes are not 98 or 99% identical, right? So I see this over and over again. Even they're admitting, well, they're not as similar as we once thought. Now, do they still believe that humans and chimps had a common ancestor? Mm-hmm, okay? Because this isn't about the evidence. It's about a worldview. It's about a starting point. So even though the evidence seems contrary to that, they still believe it because that's their worldview. That's their starting point. Now, a creation geneticist by the name of Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins, who's at the Institute Institute for Creation Research down in Dallas, Texas, uh, he's been doing a lot of human and chimp DNA comparisons. And I want to talk about some of his original research. But before I do that, I want to talk about first about what he has found and what I have found as we've evaluated these human chimp DNA comparisons that have been done by the evolutionists. So is it, are they really similar? And one of the things that we've noted is that there's a lot of preferential and selective treatment of the data. Here's the thing. Data will sing any song you want it to sing, right? It depends. Everyone knows that, right? Depends on how you present it, what you present of it. Now, is that 
right and a good thing that scientists do or other people do in other fields? No, okay? You should be honest with the data, even if it doesn't support your initial hypothesis or what you think. Um, but sadly, we don't see that a lot of times. We see dishonesty in that sense. Um, so one of the ways that they'll do this to try to get these figures in the DNA to look very similar as they'll use sequences they expect to be similar in the first place. So for example, they'll compare genes and say, oh, they have a lot of similarity. Okay, genes are what gives the instructions for proteins, right? And our bodies are basically made up of proteins. Yes, we have some fat, but <laughs> uh, mostly it's proteins, okay? And so that's what provides our, our anatomy and our physiology, so to speak. And so, but here's the thing. So from a biological perspective, we are mammals and so are chimps, right? And so are rats and cats and dogs and horses. They're all mammals. So our bodies have to do very similar things. So I would expect our DNA for those things, like genes and proteins and things, to be very similar because our bodies do similar things. We come from a common designer God. So that shouldn't surprise us that there's similarity there. But yet, if you think about it, a human, a chimp, a horse, a dog, a cat, a rat, they're all very different. So that's probably not the best place to look, right? If you're looking for differences between or what causes the differences between these two or, or these, all these different organisms. Now, one of the things that we need to realize too is that when they do count the differences, they don't count all the differences, right? They don't count what's called non-aligned DNA, gaps, copy number variations, and size differences. Now, it doesn't matter how you understand what all those different categories are, but there are legitimate differences between human and chimp DNA, but they're not counted. All right, so let me show you an example of what I mean by that. So when we write DNA sequence, we represent it with four letters, which stand for the four bases of DNA, A, C, T, and G. And so we're gonna say that human DNA is on the top there and chimp DNA is on the bottom. Now, when you put these sequences into a computer, there's three billion, we have three billion base pairs, okay? And so chimps have a little more than that, but around that. So it's a lot of DNA to compare, but the computer can do that. And there will be certain areas that align, okay? That's sort of that yellow box up there. In other words, DNA is not 100% similar in that area, but it's fairly similar, enough that it will show that it's aligned. Now, what we need to realize is, though, there's hundreds of thousands to millions of bases outside of those areas that don't line up at all. Okay, they're completely what's called unaligned or non-aligned. There's also areas within aligned regions that aren't counted when they count the differences. So for example, this is a gap, or the fancy name is indel, um, where you have human DNA but no chimp DNA, or you can have chimp DNA and no human DNA. Now, those differences are not accounted for when they give the 98 to 99% um, figure. So the legitimate question to ask is, well, why not, right? If there are differences, why aren't they counting all of these differences? And the real problem for them is that it's too many to account for in their evolutionary time frame. okay? So they believe that you, you have to have time for mutations to occur in the DNA, for all these changes to occur. Well, they think we had a shared ancestor with the apes just six million years ago. There's no evolutionary geneticist in their right mind that's gonna think you can get all these differences I just showed you in six million years. So they're, what they do is they push the common ancestor for humans and chimps back. They make it older, okay? So now instead of six million years ago, it's 13 million years ago to allow more time to get more differences. But there's a problem with that. Because when you do that, then the DNA data doesn't fit with other supposed evidences, like the fossil data and the radiometric dating data. And so here's the thing, all the data is not telling the same story, which should tell you there's probably a problem with your story, okay? Um, because if it's true, why doesn't all the evidence seem to point to the same thing and support it? Because it just doesn't. The other solution they have is they will say that the differences between human and chimp DNA are in parts of the DNA that don't matter, okay? Did you know you have junk DNA? <laughs> um, so only about 2% of your DNA actually codes for proteins, only 2%. Guess what that means? They say 98% of your DNA is junk. Now, for many, many years, they did not, and some of you are shaking your head like, I can't believe people believe that, but they did. Okay, this is legit. I've actually read books on this because I'm a science nerd. And when they sequenced the human genome, they only wanted to sequence the parts that, that were genes that led to proteins. That was only 2%. They didn't want to waste the time and money for the other stuff that obviously didn't do anything. And that's mind blowing today, right? And so, but, they, but that was the, initially that's what they thought. Now, they fortunately they did sequence at all, but 
it is important. It is doing something. Because the more and more research we do, there's no such thing as junk DNA. That 98% that's there is, is regulating the other 2%, right? Because let's face it, if our genes are similar to that of a horse, let's say, all right, but yet we're very different than a horse, obviously, um, that junk DNA is important, okay? It's controlling when, why, how, how much, under what conditions these genes are expressed, okay? And so that's how you get a lot of the differences on a strictly biological level between, say, a horse and a human being. So they're not gonna be able to use that argument much longer. In fact, they can't even use it now and, and call that legitimate um, because it, it's just not a good argument. Observational science shows that this DNA is in fact very, very important. But they don't say we're 100% the same, okay? They do say there are some differences. So then what are they counting? If they're not counting these other things I just told you about, what are they counting? Well, they're only really counting one type of difference, okay? The only type of difference that they think makes a difference. And that is what is called substitutions in aligned regions. So what they do is they will say, well, in these aligned regions, there are places where you have chimp DNA and human DNA, or sorry, human DNA and chimp DNA, but they're different. So for example, you have a T in the human and you have a G in the chimp, or you have an A in the human and you have a G in the chimp. So they both have DNA there, but it's different. Now they think that it was those differences that made made um, all the differences. Now, do they know that, right? Have they experimentally shown that it's these differences that make the difference between a human and a chimp? No, okay? There's no experimental evidence for this. But the reason they count this particular type of difference because it's, it, it gives you a 1.23% difference between humans and chimps, which is why you get 98 to 99% similarity. And they say that many differences could occur in our evolutionary time frame of 6 million years, okay? So it fits their evolutionary story, right? That's why they're reporting that piece of data, um, because it fits the evolutionary story and timeline that they believe in. Now, I'm going to show you a video um, by, it's by an organization called Minute Earth, and um, I actually checked into the video because I wanted to see who helped them make this video, right? And so evolutionists, people that were experts in the field, helped them make the video so they would have the correct information. And let's just say, I think they really summed up the differences between human and chimp genomes very well. I appreciated their honesty. It's often said that we humans share 50% of our DNA with bananas, 80% with dogs, and 99% with chimpanzees. Taken literally, those numbers make it sound like we could pluck one cell from a chimp and one from a human, pull out the tangled bundles of DNA known as chromosomes, unroll each one like a scroll, and read off two nearly identical strings of letters. But in reality, the human and chimp scrolls don't sync up so easily. In the six to eight million years since we split from our last common ancestor, chance mutations and natural selection have changed each of our genomes in radical and unique ways. Two human scrolls fused, leaving us with 23 pairs of chromosomes to chimps 24. Other large mutations revised huge sections of text, duplicating a chunk of human DNA here, erasing a chunk of chimp DNA there, while throughout the scrolls, tiny mutations swapped one letter for another. When researchers sat down to compare the chimp and human genomes, those single letter differences were easy to tally, but the big mismatch sections weren't. For example, if a genetic paragraph, thousands of letters long, appears twice in a human scroll, but only once in its chimp counterpart, should that second human copy count as thousands of changes or just one? And what about identical paragraphs that appear in both genomes, but in different places or in reverse order, or broken up into pieces? Rather than monkey around with these difficult questions, the researchers simply excluded all the large mismatch sections a whopping 1.3 billion letters in all, and performed a letter-by-letter -letter comparison on the remaining 2.4 billion, which turned out to be 98.77% identical. So, yes, we share 99% of our DNA with chimps if we ignore 18% of their genome and 25% of ours. You catch that? <laughs> So they're only 98% identical if you exclude over one third of the DNA, 
right? One third of it. That seems like a very significant portion. Um, and so, but why do they do that? Again, because, it, because they have to, to make it fit their worldview, right? The evidence is clearly contrary to it. So they're just going to alter the evidence to make it fit what they believe about the past. Um, and, and it helps us know, again, this is very much a worldview issue. You are getting the story that they want you to believe, that they want to tell, even though it's not reality. And in my opinion, and again, if you read the paper, where they compare human and chimp DNA, you see this, <laughs> like in the little, you know, in the fine print, so to speak, and, and by, by analyzing it, but most people that aren't going to read that paper, they're just going to listen to what the media says, right? And believe it or not, um, the media is extremely biased too, and, and, and they may not even understand fully what they did. And so it's a problem. In my opinion, the way it's being presented, it's very bad science and it's very deceptive science. So what is the reality? Okay, what if we don't exclude those 1.3 billion bases? What do we get? And so Dr. Tompkins' research, um, the most recent research that he's published on this, has shown there's only about an 84% similarity overall just when you're looking at the aligned DNA. All right, I'll talk about the unaligned in a minute. Now, you might think, well, that's only a 16% difference. Really, is that, is that really that much? Well, that's 16% of 3 billion, which is 480 million differences. There's no geneticists no geneticist in their right mind that thinks you can get 480 million differences in 6 million years, okay? That's not going to happen. Um, that also doesn't count for the fact that you have about 4% of human DNA that has no alignment to chimp DNA, which brings the total similarity down to 80%. The other thing, too, that we don't have time to get into is the fact that um, DNA is a three-dimensional structure, and there's literally, the only way I know to describe it is layer upon layer upon layer of information. It's not just the sequence of the DNA. There's other ways that information is encoded in there, and it, that is there, and the more that we understand that and the more that we compare humans and chimps, the more differences that we see. So this is a very conservative estimate. And Dr. Tompkins said, you know, a glaring 20% overall DNA similarity difference between human and chimp genome is an evolutionary discrepancy that cannot be dismissed. He says this raises serious issues for the evolutionary myth that humans and chimps share a common ancestor. So the uniqueness of mankind, as stated in Genesis, is now soundly confirmed by the scientific data. And here's the thing. I'm being generous in my argument to the evolutionists because let's say they could get all those differences in their time frame. You know what mutations do? They kill, right? They cause disease. They cause cancer. They cause things that aren't good. So you're not going to end up with any, you're not going to end up with something, one thing evolving into a completely different thing. You're going to end up with something dead. Okay. That's what I always say. It's not going to, mutations don't do what evolution needs them to do, which is to add new structures and new functions and to evolve into something new. You're just not going to get that through mutation. So even if they could get all those mutations, they just wouldn't do what they need them to. So there's no questions that humans and chimps have DNA similarity. We have similarity to a banana right? 50% because we have similar cellular structure. Our cells have to do similar things. So that makes sense. But claims of extremely high levels of similarity are just patently false. Um, the actual differences are around 20%. And therefore, human and chimp DNA sequence comparisons do not support common ancestry. All right, so let's move on to the next question. Is human chromosome 2 the result of a fusion that supports shared ancestry with the chimps? Now, let me give you a couple of facts, okay? And then I'm going to show you the evolutionary story based on those facts. Okay, it is a fact that humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, and it is a fact that chimps have 24 pairs of chromosomes. Now, that presents a conundrum for the evolutionists, right? Because it's not good to lose chromosomes, all right? So if you think that they had a common ancestor in the past, how is it that chimps have 24 and we have 23, right? It would appear that somehow we lost a pair of chromosomes. Not a good plan. So you don't want to do that. So they're, they're trying to think, okay, how can we fit this into our evolutionary story? How can we explain this? Well, one of the things they noticed before they started sequencing human DNA 
they could actually um, stain it, all right? And so they could see bands on it as a result. And I'll show you a picture in a minute. But they found that human chromosome 2 was very similar to chimps chromosome 12 and 13, okay? Two of those chromosomes. So this is what it kind of looked like. And again, we just see these bands. This isn't the actual sequence. And they said, hmm, the banding is patterns are similar between um, chromosome 2 and chimps chromosome 12 and 13. So they developed a story based off of that to explain how you could get differences in the number of chromosomes and not kill the organism as a result, they said, well, there must have been a fusion in the human line. Now, let me explain something very, very important here, because this is a common argument that I hear people try to use, and I want to help you know it's not a good argument to use. People will say, well, if we evolved from chimps, why do we still have chimps, all right? Um, evolutionists do not believe that we evolved from chimps. Okay, let's, let's clear that up. They believe that we have a common ancestor with the chimps, right? And six million years ago, there was a divergence off from that common ancestor. So one line became humans and one line became chimps that we know today, all right? So that's why we still can have chimps and humans today. So don't use that argument with an evolutionist because they'll say, well, that's just not true, right? We believe in a, they believe in a common ancestor that the two split off from at about six million years ago. So their story is this, that the common ancestor had 24 pairs of chromosomes. And then about 6 million years ago, there was a split off, okay? And so this line is going to become humans, and this line is going to become chimps. And in the human line, for some reason, there was a fusion that occurred between two of the chromosomes. And so that resulted in the human line, and in humans, since there are, all the humans are going to come from that human ancestor, having 23 pairs of chromosomes. And like I said, since all humans come from that line, they all have 23 today. Chimps, on the other hand, there was no fusion that occurred after they broke off from the common ancestor. And so they still have 24 pairs, just like the common ancestor did. And because all chimps come from them, all chimps today have 24 pairs of chromosomes. Okay, does that make sense? So that, that's how it works. You've got to think about what do they really believe. So this is a story that they've come up with to try to explain this. And they will say... They will go so far as to say this is definitive proof that humans and chimps shared a common ancestor. Now, here's the thing. As a scientist, I, I cannot even probably count on one hand the number of times I have said definitive proof. <laughs> uh, those are scary words that scientists don't use very often because um, most things are either supported or not supported is what we will say. We very rarely say things have been proved. Those become laws, okay? And there are very few of them in science because it's hard to show unequivocally um, that it has been proven. And so, but they are very confident. I mean, they, so they must think that the evidence is overwhelming for this, right? So I'm going to let you listen to a video um, by a theist and a cell and molecular biologist, Dr. Ken Miller. Um, and he's going to explain this story in more detail. The cells of all great apes, like chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans, contain 24 pairs of chromosomes. If humans share a common ancestor with apes, you'd expect us to have the same number. But surprisingly, human cells contain only 23 pairs. Now, if we share a common ancestor, what happened? Is it possible that in the line of evolution that led to us, a pair of chromosomes from a primate ancestor just got lost and just got discarded? Well, the answer to that is no, it's not possible. And the reason is because every primate chromosome has so many important genes on it that the loss of both members of a pair would be fatal. It wouldn't even get through embryonic development. So there's only one possible explanation. And that explanation is that in the line that led to us, two chromosomes that were separate in other primates became fused to form a single chromosome. And this is why evolution is a science. That possibility is testable. We ought to be able to look at our genomes and find that we carry a chromosome with the marks of that fusion on it. Now, how would we find that? It's easier than you might think. Typically, on the ends of every chromosome, you should find special genetic markers, or sequences of DNA, called telomeres. And in their middles, you should find different genetic markers called centromeres. 
But if a mutation occurred in the past, causing two pairs of chromosomes to fuse, we should find evidence in those genetic markers, telomeres not only at the ends of the new chromosome, but also at their middles, and not one, but two centromeres. Finding a structure like this in our chromosomes would explain why humans have one pair fewer than the great apes. If we don't find it, then the case for common ancestry for our species might be refuted. But if we do find it, it would be powerful evidence in favor of evolution. So all we have to do is to scan the human genome and see, do we have a chromosome that has these marks, telomere DNA in the center and two centromeres? Well, the answer turns out to be, we do. And it's human chromosome number two. And the evidence is unmistakable. We've suspected this for a very long time. And in 2005, a definitive study was published showing that chromosome two has the exact fusion point, almost the point at which the scotch tape holds those two chromosomes together can be found. The closer we look at our own DNA, the more detailed the glimpse we get of our own genome, the more powerful the evidence for our own evolution from common ancestry with other species becomes. Okay, now you listen to that video and you think, wow, that sounds pretty convincing. I mean, how, how can you get around that? What he says is evidence being unmistakable, right? And he even says early on, he said there's only one possible explanation, right? He says one possible explanation to explain why humans have 23 chromosomes and chimps have 24. No, there's not. There's not just one possible explanation. There's another one that God created humans with 23 and chimps with 24, right? But he's denying that completely, even though he believes in God, okay? He is a theist. I don't know if he's a Christian necessarily, but he, he does believe in the existence of God. And so it's really, again, I think you clearly see how his worldview is affecting his interpretation of the results, right? He's totally denying the supernatural um, and just saying, no, we have to have this natural explanation, so to speak, to explain this. In a New York Times article, Miller said this, is there any question to explain these facts that human chromosome 2 supposedly matches chip chromosomes 12 and 13 in light of the view that our species was uniquely designed or intelligently created? The answer is no. Again, you can only explain this by evolutionary common ancestry, right? He says the only way to explain this is if we had a common ancestor. Dr. Francis Collins, again, who's a theistic evolutionist, and I should define that term. When I say theistic evolution, that's someone that um, is a professing Christian, but they believe that evolution in millions of years is true, okay? So they believe the evolutionary ideas about how the world came into existence, not the biblical account of creation. And so uh, Colin says, the fusion that occurred as we evolved from the apes has left its DNA imprint here. It is very difficult to understand this observation without postulating a common ancestor. So he's basically saying there's no real way to explain how our human chromosome 2 is very similar to chimp chromosomes 12 and 13 any other way than we have a common ancestor. All right, so let me, let me summarize again what they are saying here. So they are saying that in the ancestor of um, chimps and humans, that there were two chromosomes, uh, chromosomes 12 and 13, and so that we see right here, 12 and 13, and then in the line that led to humans, okay, only in that line, a fusion occurred between two, those two chromosomes, and so today that's represented as human chromosome 2 in human beings, and they said the sequence data shows this, is what they're saying, so not just the bands that I showed you earlier, there's actually sequence data to show there's telomeres in the middle, and there's a centromere, there's two centromeres in it. Now, I'm gonna break it down. I'm first gonna talk about the telomere evidence, and then we're gonna talk about the centromere evidence. Let me first of all explain what a telomere is. So, um, I know today a lot of shoes are Velcro <laughs> and don't have shoelaces as much, but you know how when you have shoelaces, you have that little plastic piece at the end of the shoelace? It's called an aglet, all right? And the aglet is to keep the shoelace from unwinding, all right, and twisting and fraying. Well, that's kind of like what telomeres are, okay? They are sequences of DNA. They're at the very ends of the DNA, and they're kind of like caps. They're kind of like those plastic aglets because, and it's, 
it's kind of a confusing thing to explain, so I won't go into a lot of detail, but every time DNA makes a copy of itself, it loses a little bit of the DNA, okay? It loses a little bit of those telomeres. They get shorter and shorter. That's okay, because there's no important information in there, okay? They're just keeping all the stuff in between safe. Um, now, once they get too short, that cell will typically die. They'll stop replicating DNA and the cell will die because then you get into the good stuff um, <laughs> that's in between them and you don't, you don't want to damage that DNA, so to speak. Well, the telomeric DNA repeats itself over and over and over again. It just says the same thing. It's, it says, um, sorry, here we go. It says G-G-G-A-T-T, G-G-G-A-T-T, -G -G just over and over and over again. And they have thousands and thousands of these repeats at the ends of each chromosome. So if two chromosomes have fused end to end, you should see hundreds of thousands of that repeat, right? I mean, we know what that sequence, we know exactly what to look for. There should be hundreds of thousands of them um, where they supposedly came together. The problem is we only find several hundred, right? And that's really weird because how could it lose all that DNA? I mean, that's a significant amount of DNA to lose. Um, the, even the evolutionists struggle with this. Um, when they reported this, they said, why are the, basically, the repetitive sequences at the fusion site so degenerate? In other words, why aren't there more of them? Well, because they're not telomeres, <laughs> is why there's not more. They're not telomeres that have fused together. That's why you're not seeing them. They're actually something else. Um, and Dr. Tompkins has done some research on this to look at this, and he says they are something called interstitial telomeric repeats. So there's your really big like word for the day. They look a little bit like telomeres, but they're actually not telomeres. Um, he says they're not just there in human chromosome 2. They're throughout all the chromosomes, right? They're not unique to chromosome 2. So that's a problem for the evolutionary story. And they are functional. Um, they're pieces of DNA that have a role. They regulate other parts of the DNA. Now, something else that Dr. Tompkins found out that's very interesting is that there's a gene where all these telomeres are supposed to be, all right? And like I said earlier, genes produce proteins, right? And so they're important. And we know that this gene is expressed in about 255 tissue and cell types. So it's being expressed. In other words, it's making a protein. It is important. Here's the thing. Genes are never located inside telomeres, ever. Remember I said it, they, that DNA gets shorter every time the DNA replicates, right? It's kind of dispensable in that sense. You can't, you can't have genes there. So two, two telomeres fusing together, there should be no genes. But yet we find a gene. So that makes the evolutionary story impossible, right? It, those aren't, that is not evidence of telomeres having fused together. Now, what about this? Um, let me go back here. What about this other centromere that's in the light uh, pink there, okay? Because every chromosome has at least one centromere. So they said it has one active centromere and one inactive centromere. A centromere is usually located, a sequence in the DNA, usually located near the middle of the chromosome. And it's responsible for basically when the chromosomes divide, okay? So the proteins come out, they latch on there, and they pull the DNA apart. Um, so each cell ends up with the same amount of DNA. And that's a good thing. Now, again, centromeres typically have, it's kind of like same story, second verse here, right? So um, we have, we expect thousands and thousands of specific repetitive sequences. We know what centromeres look like, okay? What they should look like. Again, what do we find? Several hundred where they think this centromere is. We only find several hundred. It's only one-tenth the size of a real centromere. Again, no evolutionary geneticist is gonna think they lost that much DNA over time. They just aren't, this is not possible. And the sequences that we find there are not specific to centromeres. They're found all throughout the chromosomes, okay? So it's kind of like, again, the same story that we saw with the telomeres. And guess what? There's a gene there. Um, and we know it's expressed in brain and reproductive organs, and genes are never located inside centromeres, okay? So again, same idea for both the centromeres and the telomeres. They just give a lot of evidence they're really not a centromere or a telomere. And here's the thing that blows my mind probably more than anything. One of the roles of telomeres is to keep chromosomes from sticking together, okay? You don't want that. You don't want them sticking together because then they have problems lining up and dividing and getting the same amount into both cells when the cell divides. So if their whole role is to make sure chromosomes don't stick together, how is it they came together and fused at some point? 
right? It just doesn't, it just goes against known biology, right? Um, they just don't do that. Um, and so that's, that's really a problem. And that's just some of the problems with this. There are others. Um, but instead, these alleged telomere and alleged centromere are functional elements that are designed by God. They have a role. And so, like I said, that's just some of the things against this idea. So the alleged telomeres and the second centromere do not exist in human chromosome 2. Um, very low numbers of repetitive sequences and genes are found there, and therefore they don't support common ancestry. Now, here's what's interesting about it. Dr. Tompkins, who's the creation geneticist, has been in um, email communication with Dr. Miller, okay, that you saw in the video there. He has presented all of this data to him, and to my knowledge, Dr. Miller has not changed his mind. Why? Because this isn't about the evidence, right? Um, the evidence goes so against what they believe, but he's not willing to change his mind because he wants the evolution in millions of years story to be true. It really is about the worldview. Now, We've talked about the science. I've shown you, again, just the tip of the iceberg, right? There's a ton more that I could show you that support that humans and chimps do not share a common ancestry with us, that we come exclusively from Adam and Eve. But why does it matter? Why does it matter that, they're, that Adam and Eve are real and true people? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons for that, but I'm just going to talk about one and the major one, um, and that is the gospel, that Adam and Eve are actually very, very important to the gospel, because what happens if they aren't real people? And um, I hope this changes over time, but the people that grasp this really well are the atheists. Um, they actually get why Adam and Eve are so important to the gospel. So I'm going to share with you a quote from one of them. That's Frank Zindler. He is editor of American Atheist Magazine and director of American Atheist Press, and he said this, the most the devastating thing, though, that biology did to Christianity was the discovery of biological evolution. Now that we know Adam and Eve never were real people, the central myth of Christianity is destroyed. If there never was an Adam and Eve, there never was an original sin. If there was never an original sin, there was no need of salvation. If there is no need of salvation, there is no need of a savior. And I submit that puts Jesus, historical or otherwise, into the ranks of the unemployed. I think that evolution is absolutely the death knell of Christianity. Now, I don't usually agree with the atheist, but he makes an excellent point here. He says, if you don't have Adam and Eve, then you don't have a fall, right? You don't have them um, eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You don't have them sinning, then you're not a sinner. And so why do you need a savior? And, and he's absolutely right, right? Because that, to fully understand that, let's go back to Genesis, right? God told Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And if they did, they would die, right? That was the punishment for sin. And that is exactly what they did, right? Eve ate first. She gave to her husband. He ate. And what did God say in return? In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return, right? That was the punishment for their disobedience, for sin. That's when death and disease and suffering entered this world. All creation groans, right? Romans 8, 22, the world is not like God originally created it. We have thorns and thistles, right, from the ground. Animals die, people die. Um, there are bad things that happen in this world. And so that history of Adam and the fall and its relation to the gospel then is made very clear in the New Testament. So therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by the one man's offense many die, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. You get the idea that God's trying to make a point, right? I mean, because he repeats this over and over and over again. Because of the problem of sin, which starts in Genesis, with Adam committing sin, and because we all descend from him, we're all sinners, which is why we need the solution to sin in Jesus Christ, right? We have the bad news in Genesis, which is why the gospel is sometimes called the good news, right? Because there has to be bad news for it to be good, so to speak. And so we see that connection. So the gospel is rooted in the history of Genesis, it isn't some secondary doctrine, so to speak. It's a primary one because that history is foundational to the very gospel itself. Now, 
What happens though, and what I've, seen, I've worked here for 13 years, and so I've been able to observe um, what is happening um, in, with uh, many Christians in trying to believe that evolution is true, and millions of years are true, and that Adam and Eve aren't real people. If they're relegated to a metaphor, an allegory, or a myth, then what happens to the gospel? And I want to share with you a quote, uh, several quotes from uh, just one uh, theistic evolutionist in particular. Again, he is a professing Christian, but um, he believes in evolution. He believes in millions of years. He doesn't believe Adam and Eve are real people. And I just want you to know, I, I could share with you many similar quotes from other people, right? Because this has really come out in the last, I would say, five years or so, people being very um, to the point, um, so to speak, about what they believe and the implication to the gospel if Adam and Eve are not real people. So this is from Dr. Dr. Joseph Bankard. He's a professor of philosophy at Northwest Nazarene University. And um, here is what he said. So he's trying to wrestle with the idea that Adam and Eve aren't real people. And he says, if they're not, then here's some questions we need to ask. He says, however, if denying the historical fall calls into question the doctrine of original sin, then it also calls into the question the role of cross, the cross of Christ within substitutionary atonement, that Christ died to save us from our sin. If Jesus didn't die in order to overcome humanity's original sin, then why did Jesus die? What is Jesus' second Adam attempting to restore with the cross, if not the sin in the first Adam? I agree, right? If you're going to believe in the gospel as it's spoken in the Bible, and you're not going to believe in Adam and Eve in the fall, then you have some serious questions, okay, that you're going to have to try to resolve. He says, substitutionary atonement sees original sin as a major reason for Christ's death, but Macroevolution, which is the idea that every living thing evolved from a common ancestor, calls the fall and the doctrine of original sin into question. That's evolution poses a significant challenge to uh, substitutionary atonement. Yes, thank you, right? We finally get to the heart of the matter. Why do I care so much about what people believe about Genesis? Because it relates to the gospel right? That's why I care about it, because it's the history upon which the gospel itself is based. So how does he solve this problem? He says, Jesus doesn't become human to die. Jesus takes on flesh and bone to show us how to really live, how to be fully human. Wait a minute, what? That's not the gospel, right? It's not about, I mean, yeah, we need to be more like Christ. No one doubts that. But um, so he's saying that salvation is about basically Christ coming and being a good example that we need to be more like, right? That's what salvation is. And that's a problem because that's contrary to the definition of the gospel. We read in 1 Corinthians, for I delivered to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Because if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. That is the gospel, okay? In a nutshell, right? It's about Jesus dying on the cross for our sin, re resurrecting, and we believe in that, we repent and believe in that, then we will be saved, right? It's about what he did, right? It's not about what we do. It is finished, he said, right? It's not about his, him coming to earth. It's not about us becoming more like him so we can be saved. He already did that. He finished it. He said he finished it on the cross. And so, him saying this, that this is what Jesus came for, so to be a good example for us, if he believes that, and you can read it in the context of the whole article, he believes that is the gospel. That's heresy then. <laughs> um, now, I never use that term lightly, but I will always use it when it applies, because if this is what the gospel is, it's a problem, right? That's a false gospel, because that's a very works-based gospel that you can, so to speak, earn your salvation. Now, the rest of his article goes on to explain um, what he means by this in more detail. So you can, you can read that for yourself. It's online. And, but he, he says this, how does the view I've sketched differ from substitutionary atonement as it is in scripture? First, the incarnation, Jesus coming to earth as a man, is not primarily about the cross. God does not send Jesus to die. God does not require Jesus' death in order to forgive humanity's sin. So if heresy could get worse, it just did, all right? Because that's rank heresy to say that it wasn't about Jesus coming to earth to die for our sins. Again, it goes right along with what he said before, right? He didn't have to do that. He doesn't believe Jesus had to do that because Jesus would just to be a good example. And we earn our salvation by becoming more like him, right? And just, it just feeds into that. 
And here's what concerns me the most, probably, about all of this. Well, I think there's two things. One, he is a professing Christian, but if this is what he thinks the gospel is, he is not saved, right? Because this is not the gospel. So I worry for his own soul. Secondly, I'm very concerned as a, um, I taught college for six years before coming here to um, Answers in Genesis. I teach online now. So I interact with young people all the time. This man is standing up in front of a classroom and preaching a false gospel, Right? And that, and influencing these 18 to 21 year olds who are very susceptible <laughs> and very impressionable. And that greatly concerns me. You know, the Bible says not many of us should be teachers, right? And that teachers will be judged more than others. Um, and that, that concerns me because this is a false gospel. So if he's got individuals in his classroom that are not saved and they think this is the gospel, it's a false one that will lead them to directly to hell. And that concerns me. And that's why I speak out about it. That's why I say it. Because we got to be careful what is being taught at these Christian colleges today. Many of them, not all of them, but many of them. Sadly, this is the prevailing idea. Um, that Adam and Eve aren't real people. That evolution is true. That millions of years is true. Well, the gospel is something different. Right? That's what it leads to, and that's a problem. And we know what he says is heresy because Scripture is clear on this. Right? God did not send his God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Right? It had to have come through him, not through us, through him. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Right? It's about what He did because of what we did. Right? It's not about that we can save ourselves. But why does he have to do this? I mean, why commit heresy? Why redefine sin and salvation and atonement? And here's what he says at the end of his article. The view sketched above does not require a historical Adam and Eve or a traditional concept of original sin, making it more compatible with evolution. He says, I've got to change what I believe about the gospel because I no longer believe what the Bible says about Adam and Eve, about how we came to be, about sin. I no longer believe that, so the gospel has to change. Yeah, because it's all connected, right? You can't divorce Genesis from the rest of the Bible and expect the rest of the Bible to be okay. It's not. Because the very gospel itself is rooted in that and rests on that, and so that is a problem. The biblical definition of the gospel demands a literal Adam and Eve. Now, when I say that, people say, are you saying you can't be a Christian if you don't believe Adam and Eve are real people? I did not say that, okay? Because the Bible does not say that. But I will say you have a big inconsistency, okay? So you're clearly believing you're a sinner and need a salvation, but you're not believing in how you got there, so to speak, or why. And what I have seen in my 13 years of working here is Christians start out saying, Oh, I think millions of years is true. I think the earth could be really old. Oh, well, yeah, then evolution is probably true too. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The evidence seems to support that. Oh, well, yeah, then we had to have come from an ape if evolution is true, some sort of ape-like ancestor. Oh, okay, well, if that's true, and it just keeps going, right? It's a slippery slope. And before you know it, all of it's gone, um, including the very gospel itself. There's only two choices we have to be completely consistent. Both of those items are true or neither are true. That is the only way. There is no in-between on this. We have to understand that God's word has to be our starting point uh, uh, in every area, our thinking in every area. And only then can we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. And I hope that's what we all want to do. I mean, I mean, you know, okay, I would love it if you could leave here and repeat, repeat verbatim everything I just said, all right? That'd be great. What speaker doesn't want that, right? Because we believe that what we're saying is very, very important. But I don't have that knowledge. I don't have that ability to do that when I listen to speakers, right? We have speakers here that speak in astronomy and geology and areas I do not have a PhD in and I barely have any classes in, okay? So I don't, it, so those can be challenging presentations for me to listen to, but Hopefully, you get the gist of it. You get some basic answers to questions. And then, what do you do if someone asks you more in depth? You know what I do? I say, you know what? We've got a great book on that. We've got a great DVD by people who do have expertise in the field, right? Because that's what you do with everything else in life. And this is so important because, you know, we're living in a very dark world, right? No one denies that. Um, you're living under a rock if you think it's not that way. Um, it is getting darker and darker, okay? But the thing is, is that if we can have answers to the questions people are asking, and we can do that, light shines brighter in the darkness. And I think we have an amazing opportunity to evangelize and help people know the truth of God's word um, and their need for Jesus Christ as their savior, if 
if we're able to defend what we believe effectively, right? That's what we have to do because we're growing up and we're living in a generation of skeptics, right? Big time skeptics. And so how do we answer the questions they have? Um, and I have a 15 year old daughter, okay? So she's growing up in a very different world from the one that I grew up in. And if you are parents or especially if you're grandparents, you realize this, right? You see how your young people are being impacted. So let's have answers, right? And let's give them and equip them with those answers so that they can go out there and make a difference. Um, we have a news, I want to tell you some resources to help you with this because, um, and for everything that you're learning here today at the Creation Museum. We have a newsletter, it's absolutely free. It comes out once a month. You can sign up online at AnswersInsider.com, or we have a little sheet on the way out that you can get to sign up. And if you go to that website and do that, you can get a free digital download of Fire in My Bones, which is uh, Ken Ham uh, testimony. He is the CEO of Answers in Genesis, which built both the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. It's an incredible testimony, and so I hope that you'll take advantage of that. Just a, way, a good way to keep up to date with everything that's happening here um, at the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. Now, um, we had a book just, just earlier this year was released called Glass House Shattering the Myth of Evolution. And what we want to do is take on those common evolutionary ideas like transitional fossils, um, some of the things I talked about here today, and say, hey, what, how did that not... How do, how do we show that those, those aren't true, right? That those don't support evolution. So what I shared with you today about the chromosome two and the sequences, all of that information is in there, okay? I wrote chapters on that. And we were very limited in wordage. They said, you can't use a lot of words, <laughs> which for me is a problem. Uh, so we had, to, we had to make it succinct and we had to make it very understandable. And I like that. That's actually a good thing because I want people to be able to use those arguments effectively. Uh, the genetics of Adam and Eve is a, is a sort of a, uh, a little bit of what I presented today, um, plus some additional material, some other things. I go a little bit more in depth on the theological side of things in it, um, trying to explain the importance of Adam and Eve and some other scientific things that I didn't discuss today either. Searching for Adam is the book, okay, on this. Um, it looks at Adam from a historical or biblical standpoint, theological standpoint, as well as a scientific standpoint. So it was written by scientists and theologians, so it's a great, great volume to have on this particular issue. The true account of Adam and Eve. We've got to train our kids these truths. We've got to help them know that. And so this book will enable you to do that with them. Replacing Darwin is a great book if you want to get, li if you want to get more in depth on this. Okay, I mean even more in depth. This is great for college students, high school students that have a, a real interest in um, these ideas. Um, this is called, it's called Replacing Darwin's because it's suggesting a new origin of species, starting with God's word and explaining it scientifically. And so Dr. Nathaniel Jeanison is a Harvard trained geneticist um, that wrote this book. And so it's fabulous for it, even those atheists in your life, okay, that might be scientists and, and want to know more about this. The Lie of Evolution in Millions of Years, next to the Bible, um, this is the textbook of our ministry. It's why we do um, what we do. Gospel Reset, how do we evangelize in the world today? because it is very different, right? You cannot assume if you say Jesus loves you that they know who Jesus is, okay? So we got to start at a different point. And so in this book, it maybe take you two hours to read. It's a really great way to help reset your thinking on that and how to evangelize well. The Answers book 1, 2, 3, and 4 and A Flood of Evidence, which we sometimes call the fifth Answers books, are a great book for really answering a lot of those common questions that people have. Where did Cain get his wife? How do you know day means a day? Uh, what about the dinosaurs? What about radiometric dating? What about aliens? Okay, lots of great information in there uh, in those five books. So highly recommend those. I use those all the time. And we have a version of that for teens as well as a version for children because we really do want everyone to be equipped regardless of their age. Uh, we have our YouTube especially. We want to look for books, DVDs, and CDs that have a little green sticker on them. Uh, make that package. It's really great for your family. Answers Magazine. This is our um, biblical worldview magazine that comes out six times a year. Has a special kids section in it. Stay up to date with everything that's happening in the culture and science and looking at it from a biblical worldview. And I am super excited about the current issue that we have out right now because we decided to take on a very hot topic and it's called Culture in Crisis because we're taking on the sexuality uh, crisis and all those sexuality issues. I wrote an article in it, um, Are People Born Gay? Because that is one of the most common questions I actually get nowadays. Um, so I go through and explain that and the evidence that basically does not support um, that idea 
and doesn't show that. So I encourage you to sign up for that. You'll get that edition today or that issue today if you sign up. You'll also get the digital subscription for free. We have a special right now with Pure Flix, which is like the Christian alternative to Netflix. So family-friendly, faith-approving, or faith-building um, movie. Um, all of the Answers in Genesis DVDs are on there. There's like 500 of them on there. Um, and so it's a monthly streaming service. So if you sign up today, you'll get you'll get Pure Flix for a year. You'll get the magazine. You'll get like eight downloads. You get the newsletter, all for $99. So it's a really, really great deal. Um, it's over half off. So um, we'll give you a flyer and you can find out how to sign up for that. Our begin book, if you're looking for something for like new believers or unbelievers, this is a great book. Um, it starts in Genesis and goes all the way to Revelation with portions of scripture, um, some commentary to kind of tie it all together. And then what does it mean to be saved and answers to 10 most asked questions. So that's available for $3. It's like the Bible in a nutshell is what I always say. It's kind of a big picture view of scripture. We also have pocket guides available for $2 each on various topics if you just want kind of a short synopsis of some of these things. Uh, we have a couple conferences coming up, and one I want to highlight is coming up in October um, called One Race, One Blood. It will be down at the Ark Encounter at the Answer Center. Um, you can go to answersforpastors.org to find out information on that. It's not just for pastors. It's for everyone, pastors and everybody else, because um, obviously these issues are important. Um, Keith and Kristen Getty, if you're familiar with them, they're modern hymn writers and singers. They'll be performing a concert at the um, conference as well. So um, go online and sign up and find out more information about that. I'm going to be out in the lobby for a little while. So if you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop by. You've been a great audience, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day here. Thank you.